Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Pinal County Community College District Governing Board meeting of October 15th, 2024. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Dr. Odeon will lead us. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic. All right, next item on the agenda is adoption of the agenda. Do I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Do I have, I have a motion second to adopt the agenda? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. The, adoption, the agenda is adopted. And next we have call to the public. Do we have anybody that wants to speak? No cards turned in? Okay, great. All right, we'll move forward uh, under action items. Uh, we have the consideration of consent agenda, and we have the minutes and personnel report and the consent that I think everybody's read. So do I have a motion to adopt the consent agenda? So made. Second. I have a motion and second to adopt the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. The consent agenda is adopted. All right, number six. Discussion approval, disapproval of granting a water easement to Apache Junction Sewer District, Mark Salas. Hello, Salas, so we're back again I'm, on I'm back more again. easements. <laughs> I, I will say, last, last time I said, good news is we won't have any more easements. Right. Yeah, the thing is, these aren't related to the project. It just happened that uh, Apache Junction Sewer District uh -huh. yep. uh, expedited their decision to do them at the same time. So. Well, that's a good idea, then. Uh, the Apache Junction Sewer District determined the need to upsize the existing sewer line that was a previously dedicated easement on Central Arizona College's property. The construction of this line was completed by Blue Core Construction as a contractor for AJSD. It is proposed that the Board of Governors approve the easement. Wonderful. Any questions, Mr. Salas? No, yes. so many. Let's, make the, let's do it. Second. Second. If we should get it done without it. Absolutely. We have motion second to approve. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. You have the easement. Next item is discussion for approval relinquishing the Apache Junction Sewer District <laughs> easement. So this isn't the same one, I'm sure, right? All right. It's the Apache, other existing one. Apache Junction Sewer District is relinquishing the current easement that is in place on Central Arizona College's property since the new easement will now be in place. All right. And yeah, just uh, propose that the Board of Governors approve this easement. So the new one we just adopted will just replace this one in a different, slightly different location, it looks like, from the drawings. Exactly. Okay, good. All right. So moved. A motion? Second. And a second to approve the relinquishing of the Apache Junction Sewer District easement. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. All right, reports. Report from the college president, Dr. Jackie Elliott. Good afternoon, President Lopez, governing board members, faculty, staff, guests, Mary Lou. I have a couple of um, updates to provide you first. On the Pence Center, um, as you know, we're coming up on a year and remediation still continues. Um, Abatement is now necessary for the lobby area and the restroom, so the duct work is coming out of those areas as well as some drywall and um, other, the ceiling obviously to get to the, um, the duct work that needs to be abated. Um, it is anticipated that the abatement and all remediation will be completed in the next two months. Um, we have began meeting with the architect hired by the trust to discuss next steps. Additionally, um, uh, Louisa and I met with uh, members of the trust um, last week or the week before to discuss our various options when it comes to um, approaching the, um, the Pence Center and, and um, the repair. So the trust's responsibility is remediation and repair. Um, and so we're, we're continuing those and hoping that the remediation is completed within the next two months. Um, 
For the construction update, um, at uh, SMC, we did do the punch walk for the Allied Health bu Buildings two weeks ago, and the final walkthrough will be this Thursday. It is anticipated that faculty will be able to move into the new building around November 14th, so we're very excited about that. The punch walk for the Skilled Trades Building will occur next week with an anticipated uh, back walk two weeks later. So in as much, everything is progressing well and we are planning a ribbon cutting and open house on January 15th and we'll make sure we get you the invites for that. Uh, likewise, the Workforce Training Center is progressing on time as well and a ribbon cutting and open house will be ske scheduled later for the spring on that facility since it involves Pinal County, ACA, uh, LGES, and the college. Um, as far as the Arizona Community College Coordinating Council update, uh, uh, we normally call this AC4, uh, we do new ha have it now have a new lobbyist for AC4 and for the trustees as well um, in its high ground lobbying group, which might be familiar to some of you. So um, I can certainly get you th that information as well. But um, we had been with our previous lobbyists for 10, 15 years and felt like it was time to go out for an RFQ, RFP, and hire a new lobbyist. So that's who will be our lobbyist moving forward. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about construction or lobbyists or anything. Anybody have any questions? Okay. No. Great job. No questions. Oh. Oh. No, I said no. Oh. No, you said no. Great job. Thank no you. And High Ground's really good. Yeah. They have a great reputation. I think reputation. they'll do a really good job for us. Yeah, they, they've been uh, involved with the League of Cities and Towns for quite a few years. They're really good. So, wonderful. Thank you. Next, we have the Business Affairs Reports. Uh, Louise Sott, please, please come up. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Governing Board President Lopez, fellow Governing Board members, Dr. Elliott, Mary Lou, uh, staff and guests. So you have in your packet the monthly budget report. The monthly budget report reflects year to date through August of 2024. It shows the district's operating fund expenditures are at 4.21% of the total budget. This is a decrease from 5.62% uh, from August of 2023, which was at 9.83%. Any questions on the monthly budget report? And that's not a huge difference. It's a slight difference, yeah. It's, it's within the parameters, I guess. So, Any questions from the members? We're all good. The expenditures up to now. It's early in the year. Yeah, kind of. You know, it's the first quarter. All right. Okay. So um, you also had provided in your packet the awarded bids over twenty thousand. Any questions on those? No, I think they're really good. Most everything's under budget. So I think. Any members have any questions on those items? They look good. No, those are great. Thank you. All right. That concludes the. Business Wonderful, thank you. thank you. All right, next we have Academic Affairs Report. Dr. Gilliland. Good afternoon, Board President Lopez, members of the board, Dr. Elliott, Mary Lou, staff and guests. Um, I am very happy to be able to bring a Title V grant report to you all today, and I will not be giving the report. I'm going to introduce our director, Eliana Lehmans, who has been doing a fabulous job of getting this grant going and moving things forward, and she's going to give you the update for today. So thank you very much. Ellie? vertically challenged, so can you guys see me? Yes. Okay, everybody else? Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Mary Kay, for introducing me. My name is Liana Lehmans, and I am the director of Title V. Title V's uh, this new grant for the next five years. Oh, forgot I had this. Thanks, guys. Uh, buenas tardes, Board President Lopez. Uh, the governing board members, Mary Lou, Dr. Elliott, colleagues and guests. 
Uh, before I do dive into the current project of the current Title V, I do want to take some uh, time and a moment to acknowledge the significant contributions of our past Title V grants. Um, the last Title V grant was led by Nicole Costales, and the grant focused on many initiatives, as I'm sure you all kind of heard about uh, the last five years, um, guided pathways, course redesign, advising redesign, the Korean Transfer Center. Um, we're very proud with the new Title V grant to be continuing this important work throughout our current Title V grant. Uh, this project, this new grant though, again, is still a continuation. This is important for us in Title V, specifically being a Hispanic serving institution, that we're continuing the work from grant to grant. Um, this new grant is focusing on enhancing student success um, for our Hispanic and other underrepresented students. We're really focusing on keeping our students, transferring them, graduating them, uh, improving our curriculum redesign, and providing critical support services for our students. So a little story. When the grant was written back in 2022, around that time, we looked at data and we saw that about 60% of our first year students were not returning for their second year. And even more alarming, 11% of our Hispanic students, um, only 11% of our Hispanic students were graduating even though we were enrolling about 31%. So this is where the new grant started being written to trying to address uh, these uh, barriers for our students. So to address these challenges, this new Title V grant for the next year, our project includes some of our key strategies. Revising our general education curriculum to enhance student engagement and transfer rates. Offering financial literacy workshops to reduce students leaving the college for work-related reasons. Um, providing structured learning assistance in critical courses like our Math 141, which is a gateway course for a lot of our students getting their AA degree. Hiring an instructional designer to support faculty in implementing inclusive, inclusive teaching practices. Providing professional development on asset-based pedagogy to foster student retention and coordinating efforts to meet student basic needs to reduce dropouts related to financial uh, and mental health issues or burden to our students. So I'm gonna speak on some of the initiatives and these strategies that we've already gotten off the ground within our first year of the grant. And I'm really excited to take you guys on this journey that has been very, very fun for all of us. Um, and just to let you guys know, <laughs> this five-year project is supported by nearly $2.9 million in Title V funds. So, Before I walk into the initiatives and what we've done, I want to introduce you to my team. We call ourselves the FTSE 5 because we talk a lot about FTSE, right? Uh, so the FTSE 5, right now we have our basic needs coordinator. Her name is Arika Morrison. And Brittany Smith used to be our math instructional specialist. Through the grant, I get to hire two math instructional specialists. But unfortunately and fortunate for CAC, Brittany just got promoted and she became full-time math faculty. So uh, if you guys see her, make sure you congratulate her. She's doing a great, uh, great job there. Um, we were able to hire a math instructional specialist that will start in November. And the other one is still vacant, but I have high hopes that we'll find our match pretty soon. I just hired my program assistant Kimberly Ikmat right here. She actually started yesterday and she's still here, which is really exciting. She hasn't left me yet. <laughs> and then our instructional designer, which I will talk a little bit more throughout the presentation. So we're gonna start off uh, with one of the key components of our holistic approach through this new grant, which is addressing the non-academic challenges of students. Um, where our basic needs, needs coordinator, Ricky, comes into play. 
So this specific role is designed to support our students with essential services, such as housing, food insecurity, mental health, and transportation. Now I do wanna point out that this logo right here was approved by marketing, so we can use it. So that's really exciting. That was our very first win <laughs> for our basic needs. <laughs> so you're probably thinking, what are the core functions of this basic needs coordinator? So as you can see, I listed these out here. The role of our basic needs coordinator is multifaceted and is very crucial to supporting the needs of our students in a comprehensive way outside of the academic support that they need. The coordinator will act as the primary contact for students in need, like I stated before, of essential resources overseeing the coordination of food wherever possible, even collaborating with our already successful existing food pantries that we have, housing, clothing, emergency aid. Additionally, they will also secure partnerships, and that's really, really big here, because creating those partnerships to provide additional support, such as food and clothing, um, and help students access housing assistance, if they find themselves in an unstable situation is really important, especially if we're looking long-term to sustain the grant and these services, right? Partnerships are very important. Their role also includes connecting students to local, state, and federal aid programs, like our Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which is SNAP, which was formerly known as our Food Stamps Program. And I have a nice update on this that just came through last week, so I'm really excited to share that with you guys. Facilitating access to different resources like laptops, calculators, um, mental health resources, providing professional development for our staff to better support students, um, so accessing them with resources. And finally, uh, the basic needs coordinator does not work alone. We as a department in Title V are not a silos department. We can only uh, function and do the best we can with the support of the entire village that is CAC. So the basic needs coordinator works very closely with Laura Shepard, which is here as well. She is the director uh, of student rights and advocacy because they need to partner up with student services, right? So she works with Ricky on their day-to-day, -day, and I'm there to support them in any way that I can. So I wanna talk about one of the very uh, exciting things with our basic needs coordinator that just happened. Ricky, got, R Ricky started her position in February, and right away we found out about a great partnership that CAC could take a part of with SNAP. Again, the uh, formerly known food stamps. With this partnership, we had a couple things to do, <laughs> like submit a couple, I found out about an MOU, that was fun, and uh, figuring out whose desk is the paperwork on. Luckily, we all work together like we always do, and we were able to submit the application in May. We actually even got an extension on it, so that was great. We just got accepted last week, and the partnership that this brings to CAC with the SNAP outreach program is that we will be able to offer three different things, completely free, by the way. Uh, outreach and education. So we provide resources and information to help students understand and how to access their STEP benefits, how to apply for them, and really at the end empowering them to make the informed decisions that they need to make. Uh, we also will act as a self-service assistance, which means that our students can access the tools like computers to, uh, for pre-screening, applying for benefits, along with the necessary resources to submit documents for their applications, and full service assistance. So what that means is we can also offer direct help with the entire application process from pre-screening to application submission, tracking their case through DES, which is the Department of Economic Security. This barrier for students 
for any individual going through this process, it can be very confusing, very long, and disheartening. So it's nice to know that here at CAC, we can partner with this uh, uh, partnership and be able to help students get through that. They will provide the training for us, all the resources, all the flyers completely free as a partner with them. So that's really, really exciting. When Ricky started this position as well, she started to meet with students so we can know what other struggles do you have? How can I help you? As you guys can see from the data, she started in the spring, late February. She only saw five students, which might not seem like a lot, but hey, five students being helped, that is how we retain our students, right? She was able, how we classify, how we help our students is, was she able to fully help them? Meaning we close that circle, right? There is a resolution. Did she have to transfer the student out somewhere to other services? And then because we also wanna ensure, did they actually go to those services? And if they didn't, what are the barriers that prevented them from reaching out? and then maybe they weren't able to be helped because maybe we don't have in place that procedure. We don't have the funds to help with that. That's important to know. So during this, uh, the spring, she was able to help all five students complete resolution. Um, and I do wanna add that, what do I mean by the needs of these students? They were either housing, mental health, healthcare, books, food, childcare, school, transportation, financial literacy, or multiple of these needs. During the summer, she saw six students in total. Four were fully helped, one was referred out, one was a special case, they ended up dropping, so there was no resolution there. But you can see the increase now as the word is getting now. Students are learning, oh, somebody can actually, I can go to one person that can help me with multiple things outside of the classroom. And now she's, she saw 35 students as of last week. So that is great. We are definitely reaching out students. 28 of these 35 students have been fully helped completely with resolution six have been referred out, meaning that these partnerships that we're building with references for students are really being impactful, they're being used. With the basic needs, one of the first things we did was put in place specific programs in the form of grants where we can award students some assistance. The very first one that was developed was our bookstore grant. So let me tell you a little bit about this one. The program objective of this bookstore grant was to provide financial assistance to ensure eligible students have access to their course materials by the first day of class, reducing that financial burden and supporting students to be ready to go. Now this was a very exciting journey for us. Uh, you can see the flow chart, I'm not gonna read through it, but we are very intentional in ensuring that a process was created for this grant. A process to ensure not only that we could support students, but that we can do it in a timely manner. We also created a procedure guide to guide the implementation and management of the program. We wanna make sure that we're being equitable throughout and that we're, again, timely manner. When students need help, we can't make them wait a month to get the resources for their books. Uh, we streamlined the process by replacing, we used to have a Microsoft Forms, but now then we went to a Maxient form, which is the case management system here at CAC, um, and I cannot, say enough that the success of the creation of all of this could have only been possible with the collaboration of the different departments that came together here at the college. We collaborated with the bookstore, with financial aid, accounting services, um, to provide the comprehensive uh, financial aid and everything that we needed to create for this bookstore grant. So a lot of pieces working very nicely together as of right now, so that's, that's good. <laughs> uh, we work with marketing so we can create the flyers to put the word out there for everyone. And we're very intentional to ensuring that we ensure that these communications go out 
to students two weeks before classes start, right? Because we wanna make sure that students are taking advantage of the bookstore grant. Um, I do wanna point out with the flow chart of the grant, the last part of it, um, the program effectiveness, that's really important for us. And towards the end of the presentation, I will share how we're using program uh, evaluation as, ah, huh, we didn't think about that. That's interesting. And we're making adjustments for that. So data, I love data, right? Numbers always speak to me. Uh, for the bookstore grant, so when we piloted this back in the spring of 2024, 26 students applied for the grant, right? Pilot, we just started, they're learning about the grant. 13 students um, were awarded, which meant that 13 were not. Of those, there were reasons for some were not eligible, from that procedure that we had created. Some had already, you had already bought the books and one student just disappeared on us, meaning that we couldn't not get a hold of them. In the summer, we can see the numbers increase, right? Now we had 92 students that applied for the bookstore grant during the summer, 17 were awarded. And this is the first instance that we saw that the budget limit was reached meaning we cannot help every single student, which then raised another question that we need to reflect on as well. And in the fall this year, 144 students applied for the bookstore grant and only 14 were awarded. So overall, with the bookstore grant, 44 instances of course material support were provided for students, totaling $8,138.13 that were able to help students get ready for the semester. The other uh, initiative that we took upon as a basic needs department is the Transportation Assistance Fund. The objective of this fund was to help enrolled students facing short-term transportation issues that could impact their academic progress. So the fund ensures that students can remain in classes, whether in person or online, and is provided on an as-needed basis. So I'll explain a little bit about what goes into transportation assistance. Uh, I get this program was launched this summer on July 15th. And again, the same thing like the bookstore grant. We created a process, a procedure. Again, collaboration was very important. We collaborated with financial aid, account services, purchasing, uh, figuring out, for example, we're gonna give, we're gonna be able to help students with minor car repairs or maintenance expenses. And we did focus on both face-to-face -face and online because if you have a full-time online student, there's a reason why they're choosing not to be able to come on campus for whatever reason. But if they have a car to have to get to work or maybe daycare, that can still affect their willingness and say, I can't go to class because I need to get my car fixed. We work very closely, closely figuring out our very first problem to solve was how can we give gas vouchers to students without calling them gift cards? Because that's a big thing. Mark was able to help us with that. Uh, and uh, figuring it out with different departments that do similar programs like this. So that was, um, uh, Ricky was able to find a specific company that only gives you gas vouchers. You can only use it for gas got it approved, ready to go. Make sure that they sign their life away. You know, I'm only using the gas for my car. And then, uh, which is the fund acknowledgement form that was created. So a lot, again, collaboration, working through it. And with student services, they have car passes already, um, which we are able to collaborate with them. Students need them, we can send them there, we can give it to them, and it works very well. So data, because we just started uh, this summer, we've given 15 gas vouchers awarded to students. 
three car passes uh, provided for their public transportation access. Four car repairs have been funded to help students with vehicle maintenance and minor repairs. So, so far 22 instances of transportation support has been provided to students, totaling $3,797.04. Get really excited. <laughs> so I want to talk about the wins and takeaways. For the bookstore and transportation, as we're working and looking at the data, talking to the students, working with the different departments, we found that having a process and manual in place <laughs> makes your lives easier. And it makes the other departments that you're working with also very thankful that you're following what you said you were going to follow. Collaboration, again, I cannot emphasize the collaboration. Um, I cannot take credit for any of this. It's really a lot of the work of Ricky and Laura working together. Um, one of the biggest takeaways in our aha moment became when we were looking at the data of the students that were being uh, turned away. So we mainly focused uh, through the bookstore grant to help Pell Grant eligible students only, or assistance, or the ones that are getting assistance through the Arizona Department of Economic Services. Then we looked at our dashboard data, which is a great resource of data, and then we started to look and see a trend that part-time non-Pell students are the ones that are leaving us the quickest. So why are we putting this in our bookstore grant if maybe they are the ones that need the most help. So we had a reflection, aha moment, why do we have it there? So we are going to change that for the next, next roundabout of the bookstore grant when it comes out for the spring. Um, we are running on a first come first serve model and we really want to take a deeper look into that and see if that's for the best interest of our students and can we be more intentional. Um, we want to increase awareness, plan to promote more the other services, expand partnerships, that's really important for us. Um, how can we explore collaborations with other local transportation services, for example, and evaluate the impact. Um, is it being effective in keeping our students? We can help all these students, but are they staying with us? Are we helping them actually continue their education? Sustainability goals. We want to make sure that after the grant's over, can we sustain this model? And making sure that we keep adapting to the needs of students. For the basic needs portion of it, we want to look into clothing, hygiene, help, um, housing process and procedure, and uh, we are looking into having food distribution events and partner with different organizations to get that going. The other big initiative with the grant is what is called structure learning assistance. The objective of this, of this program I like to call it SLA, is to provide additional academic support to students enrolled in Math 141 through structured sessions aimed at improving success rates in a critical gateway math courses. So students are not passing their Math 141 class, which is keeping them from continuing to get their degree. Now, when we first looked at this data, oops, not, not yet. <laughs> If you can see on the right side of this data, you'll see the success and withdrawal rates for different instructional modalities. So this data, the source, um, there are the fall and spring semesters, only fall and spring from 2019 to 2023, including the 16 week courses and short term courses, so eight weeks as well. So we looked at this data and we realized that the fully online courses have the lowest success rate and the highest withdrawal rate. So that's why we made the decision to pilot SLA with Math 141 online courses to begin with to see if we can see an impact on that. Through the grant, I can hire two math instructional specialists to lead the SLA sessions 
as an extra layer of support. We collaborated with the math faculty a lot and even with advising to promote this portion because really what students are doing, they're signing up for Math 141 online and they're not being successful. So for most of us, we would figure, okay, that means that we probably need to be face-to-face -face or have some contact. But sometimes it's not possible for students' schedule. So what we are doing with the SLA, all online courses have a portion of a two-hour session where they have to attend, and it's a live streaming session, meaning that the math instructional specialist meets with them. We created a framework that was created with the collaboration of math faculty and the instructional specialists that, literally, that really put into play what are the topics that students are struggling with in 141, and then that's what we're gonna focus on. They're embedded in the online courses schedules. Three different times are offered per class to better assess uh, for students' flexibility. So we do during the day, we do evening classes, and we do weekend classes. Um, and we do collect qualitative and quantitative data. So quantitative data is pretty easy, right? We can look at the pass, withdrawal rate, um, but we also wanna know if students are actually getting something from SLA. We piloted with one class on March 18, 2024, and we saw that before SLA, and we looked at Math 141 online courses, eight-week courses only for the fall and spring semester starting back in 2018 to 2023, 28% of students passed this eight-week Math 141 class. After Math 141 was embedded with SLA, that passing rate went up to 56%. Thank you. We looked at the withdrawal rate. Withdrawal rate before SLA, 36%. That dropped to 12%. That was supporting one class, one instructor, and offering three different SLA sessions. We wanted to take a look at that data, so we dug into it. We also looked at the ethnicity and how it affected our Hispanic versus non-Hispanic students. The passing rate went from 25% to 40%, and the withdrawal rate decreased from 32% to 20%. We also looked at non-Hispanic students they had a big, the biggest increase from 30% passing to 64% passing. Withdrawal rate decreased from 38% double digits to 9%. We looked at gender as well. Our female students went from a 27% passing rate to 62%, and their withdrawal rate decreased from 34% to 8%. Males. 31% to 33% increase, and withdrawal decrease from 40% to 33%. That is a trend that we're looking at, is that females tend to have the biggest impact than males, so we wanna know why, what's going on? <laughs> why can we bring them along with us, right? In the summer, we got really excited and expanded out to all Math 141 online classes. We supported six classes and four instructors and provided 15 SLA session timeframes for students. When I looked at the data here, the before and after SLA, I only looked at the summer sessions. So we only looked at summer sessions from 2018 to 2023. Um, we didn't have such a big difference. We still had a difference though. We still increase the, the pass rate, we decrease the withdrawal rate, um, but we didn't see such a as big impact as the, f as the spring semester, but I, we can kind of figure out a little bit of why. Now for the fall. 
I just want to take a moment to thank the math department because they looked at the data and they saw that it is making an impact and we don't have a math instructional specialist through Title V just yet because Brittany just became full-time faculty. But she believed in it so much along with the math department that Eric Peterson, who's our new director of faculty teaching and learning, <laughs> and her took on additional assignments to cover the 16-week SLA online courses. Um, they're doing four 16-week courses, supporting three faculty, Eight SLA sessions are offered by both. Um, we modify the sessions from two hours to one hour just because it's double the time. And the three, they were three late Math 141 courses needed to be added by the demand of students. So the department chair, Ricardo Villa, and the co-lead, Ali Garza decided to take on additional assignments as well to cover those sections because they see how it's impacting students. So, I'm talking a lot. <laughs> I'm almost done, I promise. Wins and takeaways. We're really excited because it's showing that the SLA is a potential to boost pass rates, retention, and ultimately um, help us with our graduation rate, leading to more confident students. Some of the challenges that we see though is we can't make students go to the SLA sessions, right? They are signing up for an online class. We're just telling them this is good for you. It's really exciting though when you can actually show them the data that says, look, it is working for you. It's been great to have the support from faculty and advising so they know that, hey, if you signed up for this class, this is good for you because of this, it will be great for you. We believe that the summer terms didn't have such a high impact because it's summer. I feel that sometimes that's the reason why people signed up for online classes so they can travel. Um, we're gonna continue to monitor the different data points that we collect. We collect a, collect a lot of data points age range, gender, attendance, and demographics. I do wanna say really interesting that in our pilot for SLA, our uh, adult learners, 100% of them pass after SLA sessions. So that tells us something. That was really exciting to see. So one of the things that we, we looked at now is, for example, the high attendance experience happen during the evenings and the weekends for students. So we're gonna adjust our SLA sessions to accommodate the flexibility that students are asking for. So what that looks like on their schedule is gonna be a little bit different, but for the students, they will get their evenings and their weekend sessions to get the support. And then also we're looking at how can we scale this out? Right now, within the first year, we're only doing online. How can we scale it out to, for other modalities as well. All right, so I have told you guys plenty about what we're doing with SLA, but I think it's better to hear from someone who's actually experienced it firsthand. I'm excited to introduce Tamara Otiano. She is a full-time international student with, on, on the pre-nursing pathway. Tamara has been part of our SLA program before. She's been successful, and she is here to share how it's helped her succeed in her studies. Um, all protocols observed, good afternoon. So my name is Tamara Otino. I'm an international student from Kenya, from Kenya, East Africa. And I'm just here to share my experience with the SLA program. Um, first of all, particip participating, can you, okay. participating in the SLM program changed my approach to learning math. Despite being a uh, full-time student here, when I was taking the math program, I was also taking another course off campus. So having the different sessions over the day, evening, and the weekend sessions were um, convenient, convenient for me with the other course off campus. And then it drast drastically changed my performance greatly. I was more confident when doing assignments and also taking the tests. Brittany, who was my instructor, used to spare more time during the end of the sessions to just answer questions and uh, maybe um, sh um, shine some light on concepts that wasn't, weren't clear before. And uh, 
aside from academic success, it also impacted me personally uh, in my time management skills because it sort of forced me to like go through the module before because she will tell us what module we're going to do in the next session. So prior to the session, go through the modules and then just um, be able to ask what is not clear. And then um, an advice that I will give my fellow students is attend the sessions, they're really helpful. Uh, revise the content prior to the sessions and ask questions. Thank you. Thank you. So as we move forward through the Title V grant, we have several key initiatives still underway that are starting off. Um, we still need to work through uh, revising the general education criteria with the Age Act um, to, be, you know, to ensure uh, that we looked at an opportunity to be able to re think how we deliver it, so also adding some professional development in that realm. Uh, through the Title V grant, um, we have funds for that, so that's been, that's been fun. <laughs> the liter financial literacy workshops, there's a task force that has been created through different departments, we're doing research, what's the best way to go about it, um, how can we get students to attend, um, and if, if they're not attending, how can we incentivize them to come? Hire an instructional designer. Uh, this is in collaboration with the Director of Teaching and Learning. I've been working with Eric on this, and we just posted the position, and it's actually gonna be closing soon, next week, and we'll have an instructional designer. That will be under Title V, but work closely with the Director of Teaching and Learning, and asset-based pedagogy uh, to for student engagement, address um, uh, improved learning, enhanced retention. There is a cadre, I love that word, by the way. Cadre, faculty. Uh, the cadre made up of faculty that has already been developed. Uh, we, we put the word out there there, and we just, we're going to be providing faculty professional development. And also taking this opportunity to kind of rethink the way that we do professional development at CAC. So that's been exciting. And uh, you might hear from me after today. So any questions? <laughs> any questions the board? It's great it information, was a lot. thank you. Oh, thank no, you. Great. No questions, but, but uh, congratulations on using data to drive your decision making because it shows and it's a great story to share with, with the, not just the, the faculty and staff, but certainly to students as well because it helps in convincing the need and you've clearly expressed that. So thank you all. Thank you, thank you, it's been exciting. Any other comments? Yeah, it clearly shows, the data does show the SLA really helps, and, and that's awesome. Thank you. Great job. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Great data. Okay, next we have call to the board, board member Walker. Uh, something I mentioned before, and uh, I'd like to get some serious discussion about it at point, some point in the time in the near future. Uh, is an amphitheater to go with oh, the yeah. college campus we have at AJ. And uh, I talked with the mayor of Apache Junction about that possibility, and he indicated that uh, Mark Kelly might be able to get us some fun funding okay. to help pay for that. And so in order to get funding, we have to know how much it's going to cost. And we need to know a little bit more information about it. So I can't just walk up to these people and say, I'm going to amphitheater, you know, that but I would like to see one there because it would, number one, it would be a great opportunity for freedom of speech to be exercised. Mm -hmm. And number two, it would be a, a wonderful place uh, to uh, draw attention to the community colleges in Apache Junction, which sorely needs it. Okay, good. Okay, so that's two good reasons to uh, at least explore the possibility. Yeah, we could probably look at uh uh, some of the other colleges. I know when I was up in Glendale, Glendale Community College built an amphitheater. I'm sorry, I can't. I, I said uh, when I was up in Glendale, Glendale Community College built an amphitheater. Maybe we can get an estimate of what it costs and then update it today's costs, possibly. I don't know if we can look at that. Look at that, yeah. Yeah. You're a good idea. Thank yeah. you. Dr. Odeon. I was just glad to hear about the uh, 
work we're doing to support socioeconomic challenges through Fed Five and, and otherwise. I ran across some data this week um, that I thought was interesting because we, we hear a lot about the socioeconomic challenges and about the cost of higher education. Um, not quite so much of an issue at community colleges as it is at universities and so on, but there's certainly truth to those high costs and the challenges. But um, to put that in context, the latest data from uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, 2023 data, which is the most recent that they have at this point, um, median annual wage for high school graduates about $46,700 with an associate degree that dr jumps up to 55000 uh, more than an $8,000 increase. And of course, it's more for baccalaureate degree and so on. But it's nice to know, I think, that those changes still are there and that value still is in higher education, even though uh, the, uh, the formulas have changed over the year of co costs have gone up, but uh, that value is still there. Thank you. Gordon Kasuga. Nothing for me. Okay. I just wanted to also some of the items that the Title V assistance the students like the, the car repair mm -hmm. and fuel costs, those are, and fuel was so expensive not too long ago. It was crazy. And then if your vehicle breaks, you're done. You don't have a ride and then you look around. So those are really critical. I'm glad you have those, that you're looking at that. Just shows the importance of, of the program. And uh, I just want to mention how important the work uh, the CAC does in all different realms, education, the workforce development. It's so important when we meet with companies that want to relocate to our area, they talk about that and how important the community colleges are to that effort. It's really community colleges are in the forefront of that effort to provide those services. So thank you all for all your hard work and everything you do, you really do. And with that, if we have nothing else, I call for adjournment. I oh, adjourn this. Oh, yes, sir. I said so made. All right. We'll adjourn this meeting. We're adjourned. Thank you. Great. Thank you.